Erev Tov, good evening. Tonight's shiur has been sponsored by Fuatah Shalama of Yitzchak Daniel Ben Batya Ilana. I shall have Rufuah Shalama, B'zat Hashem, B'toch Shar Chonei Yisrael. El Na Rufanano, El Na Rufanano, B'zat Hashem. Amen, Kedir Ratzor. We are right now at the bottom of page Bet Amud Alev in the Talmud Bavli, or in the Gemara section of the first part of the En Yaakov. So really what we're calling the second sugya in our shiur. Let me repeat what we studied last week. And from there, we're going to take it, we're going to jump a few steps. So when I was going through, normally what we would do is we would sit down and read the Gemara once. Rashi, we did that already last week. And then we decided normally, we would take apart some of the more pilpulistic parts of the Talmud. But when I was going through the Mepharshim here, there was nothing that I felt would be of relevance to the Mepharshim that we're going to study later that we should spend time right now getting stuck on this sugya. So rather what we're going to do today is we are going to review the Gemara. We are then going to study a piece of Harav Kuk, Alam Shalom, and then possibly do a second one, or next week we'll do the second piece of Harav Kuk, and then we're going to continue that one snippet of a sugya, that last line that we didn't do last week, that will be an entire new can of worms, without the shame. We'll get to that when we get to it for right now. Uh, if you see the words Mikdi or Mikde, so the Gemara asks the following question. If you remember in the Mishnah, the Mishnah says, "When do the Kohanim come to eat their Tehuma? The Kohanim come to eat their Tehuma from when? From when three stars come out?" So the Gemara asks the question: Why does the the Mishnah feel? Why does the Mishnah just say, when do we say Shema in the evening? When three stars come out. Why does the Mishnah in, so, uh, go out of its way to say this, when do you begin to say Shema in the evening? You say Shema in the evening from when the Kohanim entered the Tehumah. Then in your head you have to calculate, from when the Kohanim entered the Tehumah, Kohanim entered the Tehumah, when three stars come out. Why that circular uh, conversation? Why not just be direct? So the Gemara asks the question, Mikdeh Kohanim, when do the Kohanim, who became Tima'im, who were impure, and now they're coming to do Tevila, from which moment after their purification process are they able to eat from the Tehuma? Says the Gemara, Mishat Kohanim, from when three stars come out. If that's the case, that Kohanim are able to eat their Tehuma from when three stars come out, and we know that that's the case. So why didn't the Gemara just say, Litne Mishat the Kuchavim? The Gemara should have just said, From when do you read Shema in the evening? From when three stars come out. Why involve the Kohanim here in the conversation regarding Kirat Shema? So the Gemara answers, Milta Agav Orche Kamashmanan. The Tana, the author of the Mishnah, is attempting to teach us something else, B'derch Agav. Along the way, he wants to teach us a different halakha. I had a piece, B'derch Agav. I had a piece I wanted to refer you to. Let me think for a moment. So if I get a chance, I'll bring you a piece later on uh, in, in the coming weeks. So the Tana wants to teach us something else. What do you want to teach us? Kohanim emat kach le bituma. When do the Kohanim either tuma? Mishat the Kohanim. When three stars come out. Vahak kamashmalan. What is the chidush? I mean, what is he coming? Kamashmalan. What is he come to teach us? The kapara la meakva. The kapara, the atonement. What is the atonement? What is what atones? The Koban. So the Koban that he offers the next morning, Lam Akma, does not hold him back. Meaning, even though tonight is the eighth night, and he's been to the Mikveh, and the seventh day has passed, and the sun has set, even though tomorrow morning he's going to have to offer a Koban. By the way, the Tosafot read this Gemara entirely differently. They read this all in the time of Rabbeinu Tam. 
So here there's something that happens completely not according to what we understand in the Gemara. But if that's the case, so really you should wait until tomorrow to eat the Tumah. So no, the Tanah was teaching us that he does not have to wait till tomorrow. Kapara, the atonement, the sacrifice, la me'akva. The atonement does not hold him back from eating his Tumah. Remember this term, kapara la me'akva. That not everything is held back by one's atonement. This is important because it's going to take us into the world of Rav Kook in a moment. But let's not get carried away. Kedatanya, like we learn in the Baraita. Uva Hashemesh Vetaher, and then the Torah says, Vachar Yuchal Mir Kodashim, and then afterwards he eats from the Kodashim. The sun set and the day passes. So what do you see from here? Biat Shimsho Me'akavto Menechol Bituma. It's the setting of the sun which holds him back from eating the Tehuma. He's so long as the sun has not set. Even though he's been to the Mikveh, he's still not allowed to eat from the Tehuma. And his atonement, his kapara, does not hold him back from eating the tuma, even though, even though he's still in the category of what we call a mechusar kipurim. He's lacking a koban, which he's only going to offer tomorrow. Nonetheless, it's not the koban, it's not his atoning sacrifice, which holds him, that separates between him and his tuma. Rather, it's only the sun setting. Now remember the Gemara is going to discuss what we already did last week about the Pasuk that we mentioned. Uva Hashemesh v'taher. Umimai dehai uva Hashemesh lebi'at Hashemesh. How do you know that that which it says uva Hashemesh and the sun came is referring to sunset? Vehai, maybe what it says v'taher shetal yuma. And how do you know that when it says taher and it becomes pure, it literally means that the day has become pure, meaning the day has passed. How do you know that? Maybe that's not what the Pasuk means, says the Gemara. Rather what? Dilma, the top of the next page. Maybe you should explain the Pasuk this way. Biat Orohu. Maybe it's talking about sunrise. Like we said, here comes the sun, that's sunrise. Umay v'taher, and what does it mean v'taher, and it becomes pure? Tahar gavra. So the individual does something to make himself pure. This is the Gemara, maybe you're reading the whole Pasuk incorrectly. Maybe, instead of saying the sun set, and the day has been purified, I mean the day has passed and now the person is pure, maybe it means that the sun is rising on the eighth day, tomorrow morning, and once Vitaher, once he performs an action of atonement, of purification, then he's permitted to eat his tuma. Maybe that's what it means. You understand so far what the Gemara say? Yes? Amar Rabba Barav Shila. So Rabba Barav Shila said, this is the answer of the Gemara. Imken, if this was the case, Le Makera Vitar, the Pasuk should have used. If this was the case, meaning that it's talking about the morning, and that the person has to actively do something to become pure, the pasuk should have used the active word, vitar, and he should go purify himself. The shon tzivui. It's a commandment, an action. Rather, my vitaher, what does the word vitaher mean as opposed to vitar? Tahar yoma. The day has passed. Kedam re'inche, like the people say, there's a folk saying, i'arav shimsha vidakeyoma, that the sun has set and the day has passed. So this is the first understanding here of the Gemara. So the Gemara makes uh, our Chachamim in Babel, in Babylon, they explain the Gemara to say, this Pasuk, this Mishnah, it all is talking about sunset, and it's coming to teach you that the Kohen, eats his tilma when three stars come out. That's when you say Shema. And that a Kohen does not have to wait until the following morning to offer a sacrifice in order to eat his tilma. But now we have another conversation. Our Chachamim learn Torah everywhere. Not just in Bavel. Our Chachamim in Eretz Yisrael, Bema'arava, in the West. Who's the West? Eretz Yisrael. In Eretz Yisrael, 
הדרבה ברב שילה להשמיע להו. They didn't hear this teaching of רבה ברב שילה. They didn't hear it. I mentioned to you last week that Deret Eliyahu says, maybe they heard it, but it's possible to understand this language to say that even though they heard it, they didn't accept it. It wasn't a, a logic that they accepted. So what do they do? They have the same problem, the same question. And this was their suffix, this was their question. How do we know that that which the Pasuk says, Uva Hashemesh, refers to sunset. Umay v'tahayr, and what does it mean, and it becomes pure? Tahar yomad, that the day has passed. O dilmar, maybe the Pasuk means, biat orohu, that it's sunrise. Umay v'tahayr, what does it mean, v'tahayr? Tahar gavra. Maybe it's an active thing. It's talking about the morning, and he has to purify himself. The Hadar Pashtuna. And after they had this doubt, our Chachamim and Eretz Yisrael, they came up with a different answer. Mi Brayta from the Brayta. Mi Dekatane Brayta when they taught us in the Brayta. Siman the Davar Tzeta Kochavim. For when did the Kohanim eat their Teruma? That's Tzeta Kochavim. What three stars come out? And therefore, Shema Mina, from here you learn, Biat Shim Shohu, that it's talking about the setting of the sun, Umai Vitaher, and what does it mean, Vitaher? Tahar Yoma, that the day has passed. And therefore, our rabbis in Eretz Israel and our rabbis in Bavir, they reach the same exact conclusion, but with two different methods, two different logical arguments. No, this is not something that I'm saying now from a source, but it's something that I think to myself. Very often you can find that two people who never met each other, who never read each other's works, who never spoke to each other, who were not even influenced by the same people, will both say the similar, same or similar statements that are truthful. And it's something very unique. It's unique because people who are in a search for the truth, they find the truth. And some people come to the truth from a different place, but ultimately the journey is not the only part that is important, it's the conclusion. And that's why you'll sometimes find, I always tell people, you know, we like to split up the Chachamim between Sephardic Chachamim and Ashkenazi Chachamim or however else, whatever other artificial divides. But there are Ashkenazi Chachamim that I will tell you are more Sephardic than some of their Sephardic counterparts who are more Ashkenazi than some of their Ashkenazi counterparts. We weren't lacking uh, uh, exceptions in each side of the Jewish world. And there are certain Chachamim of Chachamim Ashkenaz that I'm certain would live in absolute harmony with Chachamim Sfarad. And vice versa, there are certain Chachamim Sfarad that perhaps would have been more comfortable in the world which was Ashkenaz. And this is the way that it works, is that two Chachamim, two different places, are both searching for the same truth. They have the same questions. Their answers may come to them differently, but they reach the same conclusions. And that's something beautiful to see. It's a beautiful thing to see. When we started uh, Kilat Shara Shamayim, we were adamant not to call our Kilat Sephardic Kilat. For a reason. I told people, when, when all the other synagogues call themselves the Ashkenazi Minyan, we'll call ourselves Sephardic Minyan. Yeah. But until then, why are we Sephardim and they're just regular? When all the other Bataydin call themselves the Ashkenazi Bedin of America, we'll call ourselves Sephardic Bedin. But until then, why should we do that? But more important than that, more important than that, is that the divides are not ethnic divides. They're philosophic divides. And we accept that there may be many people who ethnically don't fall on one side or the other side, but the truth that they find belongs to one place. They're even Chachamim. Chachamim that we quote, that we study from, and oh, that is Sephardic, they're not. But their Torah is beautiful, and their Torah is sweet, and their Torah is relevant, and of course we'll quote them. And that's the way it should be, is to realize that people who are truth seekers ultimately will appreciate truth when they discover it and when they see it by each other. I think that this will explain so much of our Chachamim and their relationship with non-Jewish philosophers and other clergy members of different faiths. And it's not for one moment that any of these Chachamim who sat down with Muslim sheikhs or sat down with Christian priests or sat down with Greek philosophers, it's not for one moment that they had a doubt. Maybe Torah is true or maybe the Quran is true. None of them 
ever went through that loop. But it's here I'm sitting across the table with another human being who is spending their time and their energy focused on the creator of the universe, focused on perfecting themselves, focused on a pursuit of creating a better world that revolves around the creator of the universe and what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants for the world. So of course we have something in common. Of course there is something that we can learn from each other. Masech Adech Eretz, in the back of the Gemara you'll find the back of Eduyot and Horayot and, and Tamu Bavli. It's a famous story there with the Chachamim and Rabban Gamliel. They were walking together and they said to each other, Ma'dad Chash and Evaker, Philosoph Chavarenu, what is your opinion? Shall we go stop and visit our dear friend, Philosoph? The commentator said, who's Philosoph? Philosoph was a non-Jewish pagan priest. Chavarenu, he's our friend. He's our friend. It's possible to live in a world where not everything matches and not everything is symmetrical and not everything is perfect. But we're similar enough that we could call each other friends. That concept exists in Torah. Halavai, that we should live to see that inside of Am Yisrael. Outside of Am Yisrael, I have no expectations. I have no expectations that Chachamim who can't get along with each other are somehow going to get along with the rest of the world. But if they're truly in pursuit of peace, all kinds of wonderful things could happen. Are you ready to study something from Rav Kook? Want to jump into something different? It's on this piece of Talmud. It's Rav Kook's reading of this piece of Talmud. At least the first part. I don't think that today we're going to get to the second part of his piece, but at least the first part. Uh, I attached a PDF for you to your Zoom invitation. So if in the, whichever of the Google Classrooms you got here from, you want to open it up, there should be a, it should say, en ya, uh, Agarata Talmud, Agarata En Yaakov, and it should say, En Aya Text, something like that. It's a PDF. Do you see what I'm talking about? Now, I don't have that PDF in front of me, so I'm going to ask that somebody who does have that PDF, I have the book, somebody who does have that PDF in front of them, if you could just tell us on which page is the subsection which says bet. It's the Aleph and then bet. We did Aleph last time, and then bet should be what we're doing this time. It's a PDF of Rav Kook. Uh, Pam, is that page two? Okay, page two. You see page two of Rav Kook's PDF? It should say, En Aya. En Aya. Aya is Rav Kook's name. Abraham Yitzchak HaKohen. Page two? Page two, there should be a little like cursive bit in the middle of the page. Yeah, you see it? Okay, let's read. Yeah. Rav Kook writes on this passage of the Talmud of when do the Kohanim come to the Tuma, when three stars come out. And what do we learn from there? Agav Okhe Kamash Malan is teaching us something else, which is that the Kapara, the atonement, does not hold back the Kohen from eating his Tuma. So this was the question. The question was, why does the Mishnah skip? Uh, not skip. Why does the Mishnah not skip this whole conversation? Why does the Mishnah say that when do you read Shema, when the Kohanim enter, these are Timumah, and then we know that that's three stars come out. Why does the Mishnah just take the direct route and tell us that it's when three stars come out? So the Gemara gives an answer. What's the answer of the Gemara? Not only are we learning that the Kohanim eat their Tehuma when three stars come out, we're learning something else, and that is what? The Kapara. What's the Kapara? The sacrifice, the atonement. It doesn't hold him back. This is the extra halakha. Rav Kook says there has to be some kind of significance here. There must be something more that Chachamim are trying to teach us than what means die. And there are those, by the way, who don't like to look for extra significance at anything Chachamim say. 
That's fine. As I told you at the beginning of our shiurim, when it comes to the realm of Agadah, it's not necessary to believe that Chachamei Israel said any of this. We are, this is Begeder Derasha on the Talmud. We are taking a passage and trying to pull other ideas from it, not necessarily that fit in the Talmud in the first place. And that's something we have to be aware of. We're not, we're not purporting to be explaining the Pshat here of the Talmud in any which way. So even though the Gemara gave its answer, Rav Kook wants to give a different answer. Here's what he writes. Shne devarim shonim yesh betahara. You see that sentence under the bed? Shne devarim shonim yesh betahara. There are two different ideas or things that happen when it comes to purification. Hasiba shel hazman, sheena tluya b'mitaher, v'hasiba shel hakapara, there's two elements that come in with purification. There's the first element. The first element is time. What does it mean, time? There's a certain amount of time from the beginning of the process which a person takes to refine themselves, to purify themselves, to fix themselves, until that becomes complete. So let's say the Kohen has finished his purification. He's gone to the Mikveh. He's done whatever he could do. Is he Tahoe on day six? No. Why is he not pure on day six? Because even though he did what he needed to do, there's still another element he's depending on. What is that element? The element of time. Time. Yeah, he has to wait until the right day, until the right time in that day. So the seventh day has to pass completely, and the eighth day has to begin completely when three stars come out. And then there's the second element. And the second element is the active element, the conscious work of a person to become pure. We are trying to come close to our Creator. How do we come close to the Creator? What do we do the next day? What happens the next day? On the eighth of the morning? We bring the korban. Korban, now if you remember, and I, I'll, on one foot I'll share with you this idea. The Rambam and the Moren Vuchim shares with us a concept that korbanot are not a fundamental of the Jewish faith. Rather, it almost seems that sacrifices are some kind of damage control. The creator of the universe saw just how deeply we were involved in pagan worship. And at the root of pagan worship is the sacrifice of all kinds of living creatures. The creator of the universe decided not to fight us, so to speak, on this. But to allow us to continue sacrificing sacrifices, as long as it fell within very clear parameters that he controlled. What kind of animals which type of day, which year, for which reason, in which place, only in the Ben Mikdash, only with the guidance of Kohanim, and so on, and so forth. Ultimately, there will come a day, according to the Rambam, or at least the understanding of the Rambam, and you should know, this matter is a matter of such debate, and I didn't mean to stick my head in it right now, in which human beings are able to worship the creator of the world without having to kill animals in order to do it. According to the Rambam, the Kobanot themselves are not the essence. The essence is to come close to the creator of the universe. And that's why the Prophet, his proof, looks throughout the writings of the Prophets. The Prophets say, Lama li rov Why do I need all your sacrifices? I don't need them. Meaning, if, what does it say? Um, um, his lips are close to me, but his heart is far away from me. Meaning, you're coming to the Bedim Dash, you're bringing me a dead goat, a dead cow, whatever it is. But you are not here, you're not present, you're not conscious, you're not aware. What do I need a dead cow for? Says, do I, am I missing cows? Do I not have, own enough cows in the world? Am I missing some fat or some blood, says the creator of the universe? Is that what you really think I need? It's comical, by the way, when the Christians come to us. And they start thumping us on the head with the Leviticus and the blood. And how do you do anything without the blood? And you know, your average Jewish person has no idea what they're talking about. What, what is blood? What are you talking about blood? It sounds very gory for your average Jewish person. Their whole thing is we are, are dependent on sacrifices in the Ben Mikdash for our closeness to the Creator. And therefore, if we don't have the blood of a dead goat, then we have the blood of another goat, which is their God. Human sacrifice. Yeah, exactly. The epitome of human sacrifice. 
It's not just like Hakadosh Baruch Hu says, "Don't kill your sons," meaning don't offer your children to Molech. Here in their religion, Hakadosh Baruch Hu's own son is offered to Molech. You understand how this works? This is a, it's a for us it's craziness, but it's very simple to any Jewish person that the kolbanot are a, a means to an end, but they're not the end. They're not the purpose. That we can come close to the Creator if we don't have a bed mikdash, we don't have dead goats, we don't have dead cows, we don't have libation offerings and wine offerings. We still have tevilah all day long. We still have limut Torah. We still have the experience of mitzvot. We're not dependent on that. The bed mikdash for other reasons, but for the dead goats, not because of that. And so here, here we have to understand the purpose of a koban is not the killing of an animal tomorrow morning. The purpose of the Koban is an action that brings us closer to the creator of the universe. If you want to understand why a Koban brings you close, that's for a different shiur. I have some shiurim on that, but not for right now. Uh, the whole purpose, though, of the Koban, Lashon Karev, Korban, Kuf, Resh, Bet, the whole purpose to bring us close to the creator. So says Rav Kook, there's two things that happen here. There's a passive closeness to the creator, a purification that happens whenever the time is ready. Whenever the seventh day passes and the three stars come out, that happens automatically. And then there's an active element in purification. Something we have to do that brings us closer to the creator of the universe that happens the following morning. So we can accept there are two elements, a passive and an active element in coming close to the creator of the universe. Rufku continues. Gam Israel, also among the Jewish people. Linyan Kiryat Shema, regarding the calling out of Shema. Do you remember what Rav Kook told us last time? What is the purpose of Kiryat Shema? He doesn't translate it as the reading of the Shema as much as the calling out of Shema. What are we calling out? Do you remember what he told us? We just studied Rav Kook not so long ago. Rav Kook told us previously that we have an obligation as Jewish people to call out HaKadosh Baruch Hu to the world. First to ourselves, and then to the world. There's two Kiryat Shemaz. The calling out of Hashem's oneness to ourselves. When do we call out HaKadosh Baruch Hu to ourselves? Kiryat Shema Shel Arvit. The Kiryat Shema of the evening. What's the significance of evening in the writing of Rav Kook? The exile, in Galut, in exile, we are focused purely on ourselves, on fixing ourselves. But ultimately, we will come to a Kiryat Shema Shacharit, a, a Shema Yisrael of the morning, in which we call out the name of a Kadosh Baruch Hu to the whole world. But that only happens later, that happens in the daytime, that happens in the redemption. So Rav Kuk here is building on that thought that he taught us last time. Linyan Kiryat Shema, also in the Jewish people when it comes to Kiryat Shema. Linyan Kiryat Shem Hashem Bichlal, regarding the general calling out Hashem's name. Shehu Shoresh Bechiratan Shel Yisrael, it is at the root of why the Jewish people were chosen. is for us to call out HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name to the world. Yeshnam Shne Devarim, there are two elements in that calling out Hashem's name to the world as well. Hazman, there's time. Shi'im hazman, Shi'im, en adayin hazman mukhshar. That if the time is not yet ready, kigon kodem atan Torah. So, for example, before the giving of the Torah, lo haya haolam yechol adayin lekabel or Torah. The world was not yet ready to receive the light of the Torah. Yes, Hakadosh Baruch Hu decides to give the Torah on Har Sinai, but if the Torah was somehow going to be given before Har Sinai. The world was not ready to receive that light, which is called Torah. And so that was something that was dependent on time. The world was in darkness. And then the atonement. We keep talking that the atonement doesn't hold him back from eating the Tehumah. The atonement doesn't hold him back from eating the Tehumah. Ha-Kapara, which is Teshuvatan Shri Israel, the redemption of the Jewish people, Lehavi Ora Shalema brings out a complete wholesome light to the whole world. So like we said previously, there's a calling out of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that is the purpose of why the Jewish people exist in the world. We say this every day. 
This is the purpose of why we're here. In order for Am Yisrael to be able to reach the place in which they can fulfill their goal, their purpose, of bringing the creator of the universe everywhere in the world, there are two steps of purification they have to go through. There's the element that is the world, the readiness of the world to be able to accept the message that the Jewish people came to bring to the world. And there's the readiness of the Jewish people to be able to be the messengers for the world and to give them that message. So we might be ready to give a message to the world. It could be that we were ready a thousand years ago to bring a message to the world. But for whatever reason that is dependent on time, the world was not ready to receive the message of the Jewish people. Just like before the giving of the Torah, the world was not ready to receive the message of the giving of the Torah. And there's the second element, that as the Jewish people, the inner work that the Jewish people have to do, that they have to fix themselves, to purify themselves, in order so that when the time is ready to bring the Torah to the world, to call out the name of HaKadosh Baruch to the world, will the Jewish people be able, will they be mature, will they be ready, will they be purified enough to bring about the right message? Will they be loyal messengers to the creator of the universe to bring out the name of Hashem to the world? Those are two different things that are intertwined with each other. Let's continue reading. In regards to calling out the name Hashem, Hashem in the world, which will happen when the redemption will be complete. In order so that Am Yisrael can give to the world what the world needs, Kaparato me'akavto. Our atonement holds us back from reaching that level. What does that mean, says Rav Kook? In order for us to be able to be loyal, faithful messengers, to bring the genuine message of HaKadosh Baruch to the world, there is a tremendous amount of inner work that we have to do as a people, individuals and as a nation. And there's no way to do a shortcut around that. There's no way to skip that process. Tish kaparato me'akavto. Our atonement holds us back. If we don't do what we need to do, we will never reach that place where we'll be able to give the world what the world needs. By the way, by the, I'm not reading now from Arav Kuk. I'm telling you something. The moment the Jewish people disappear from the world stage, if I could borrow from modern uh, terminology, the moment we stop becoming influencers on the global stage, then all kinds of counterfeits begin to step in our place. They fill in the void for us. People sometimes wonder, what is the deep draw of people to Yeshu? Yeshu came at a very opportune time in Jewish history. He came at a time where the world needs a Jewish person to give them spirituality, needs a Jewish person to guide them on the path to the Creator. But the Jewish people have abandoned ship. The Jewish people are not doing what the Jewish people need to be doing for whatever reason. And so it's very easy for a counterfeit to step in and take over that job for us. When that hope is shattered, so other people start to fill in the void. Other religions start to creep up. But that's because we're absent. We haven't done what it takes in order for us to return and influence the world in the way that we're supposed to influence it again. So let's call that inner work the Jewish people need to do, let's call that teshuvah, yes, teshuvah. Teshuvah, which is directly connected to our kapara. Our atonement holds us back from accomplishing that goal that we need to accomplish. By the way, at which point do we offer a sacrifice? The Kohen is impure for seven days. He comes to say Shema Yisrael of the evening. Does he have to offer his sacrifice yet? No, not yet. He reads the Kiryat Shema of the evening while still not finishing his 
kapara. He's not finished entirely his purification process. Tomorrow morning, though, when it comes time for Kriyat Shema of the morning, what does the Kohen have to do then? Well, the mercy already did. He has to finish. He has to offer his sacrifice. Meaning the Kriyat Shema of the redemption of the future, the Jewish people have work that they need to do actively before they will be able to be the messengers of the world when the day comes, when the sun rises, when the redemption comes to the world. But we're not talking about the morning Shema yet, correct? We're still talking about the evening Shema. Listen to what Rav Kook tells us here. But regarding the Kriyat Shema of the evening, Kriyat Shem Adonai Alenu Latzmenu, the calling out of the Creator's name on ourselves, the inner work that the Jewish people need to do, the oneness of Hashem that is found in the Jewish people, En Davar Yechol Le'akev. There is nothing that can hold the Jewish people back from being children of the one God of the universe. Even though the Jewish people are destroyers, they're destructive Jews, meaning they've rebelled against the creator of the universe, they're still called the children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is referring to a passage of the Talmud in Masechet Kiddushim. We have some time. Let's, let's pull up Masechet Kiddushim, just for a moment. I brought a Gemara with me. If you want to go to Sepharia, you want to click on Talmud, and then find in there the tractate called Kiddushin. And open up the page 36a. It's about in the middle of the page. There's a famous argument here in the Gemara. I'm sorry, can you repeat the daft again? It's Kiddushin 36a. Lamed Vav Of course. Says the Gemara, Uben la Abaye, Uben la Rava, whether you're talking about Abaye or Rava, Hai banim atem, my dar shibe. What does the Pasuk mean when it says, Banim atem, you are children of God. Rabbi Yehuda says, so long as you act like children of the creator of the universe, you are called children of the creator of the universe. But if you, Chaz Shalom, don't act like a child of the creator of the universe, then you're not called a child of the creator of the universe. I mean, you can lose your status as a child of the creator of the world by not acting properly to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Rabbi Meir Omer, Rabbi Meir says, Ben kach u ben kach atem kiruim banim. Whether you follow the will of the creator or you don't follow the will of the creator, whether you do mitzvot or you don't do mitzvot, you are still called children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Like the Pasuk says in Devarim. Sorry, no, in Yirmiya. Banim sechalim hema. And it says in Devarim, Banim lo imun bam, the unfaithful children. And it says in Yishayahu, an evil offspring, destructive children. And it says in Hosea, that in the place where they told you you're not my nation, you will, all, you will soon be called the children of the living God. Says Rabbi Meir Balanes, that this status of the Jewish people as children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is irrevocable. Regardless of what they do to the creator of the universe, the Jewish people are children of the creator of the universe. Rav Kuk is utilizing this concept. Let's look back inside of our Hinaya. Rav Kuk is saying 
that when it comes to the internal name of Hashem that is upon the Jewish people, there is nothing that could sever the tie between the Jewish people and the creator of the universe. Even though they are destructive, they are still called the children of Hashem. And there can be no holding back the relationship between the creator and the Jewish people, aside from a temporary one. What does it mean a temporary one? Mitzad erech hazman, only in the element of time. Kmo shaya kodem matan Torah. Like before the giving of the Torah, the Jewish people didn't have a Torah. It's not because HaKadosh Baruch Hu severed himself from this offspring of Abraham. It's because the time had not yet come to reveal himself to the Jewish people in the way the Jewish people needed. Yet, it was a matter of time. It'll be there. It's a matter of time. אבל כפרה בתשובה לא תוכל לעכב על זכיות עולמנו הפנימי, זכיות עולמנו הפנימי. תשובה, no matter how bad we are, it cannot disturb the inner tranquility, that inner world between us and the creator of the world. הדומה לאכילת הכהן התאומה, like the Kohen who comes to eat his Tehuma in his own inner chambers, nobody else can touch that Tehuma. The Tehuma is not for the world, the Tehuma is only for the Kohen. And that's what it says in Yishayahu. If you want to open up Yishayahu, it's in Perek Nun, there's a Perek 50. Pasuk Aleph. We read this Haftarah in Parashat Ekev. It's one of the more beautiful Pesukim. Says the Navi, Yishayahu chapter 50. Ko amar Adonai, this is what Hashem has said. Eze sever keritut imachem asher shelachtiha. Where is your mother's bill of divorce that I sent her away? O mi minoshai asher macharti etchem lo. Or which of my creditors have I sold you to? Hen ba'avonetechem nimkartem, ufishechem shulchayim achem. It's because of you. Says the Kadosh Baruch it's not because of me that you're gone, it's because of you that you're gone. But then that pasuk is balanced out by the pasuk in Tehillim, which David HaMelech says, Ki lo yitosh Adonai Amo, what does the pasuk continue? What does it say? Ki lo yitosh Adonai Amo. V'nachalato lo ya'azov. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will never abandon his people. If for any reason we see some kind of temporary uh, uh, severing of ties between the creator of the universe and ourselves, it's temporary. It's just a matter of time. In order for the Jewish people to rise up, to do what they need to do in the world, that inner work nobody can hold us back from. This inner connection between the Jewish people and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is an authentic, untouched, pure connection. And so even when the Jewish people do something wrong, no matter what I say in the world, no matter what I do in the world, my mother will always be my mother, and my father will always be my father. And I will always be their child, even if sometimes maybe they don't want that to be the case. But no matter what happens in the world, we're part and parcel of each other. May there be times we will get an argument, will there be times? Of course. But that natural, authentic connection between us cannot be severed. And that's why the Navi tells us, is there any bill of divorce? Is there anything that I ever gave you that severs us? I will never leave you. Even if it looks like I have left you, I will never leave you. Just because you don't call your parents, doesn't mean they're not your parents anymore. Just because your parents don't talk to you, doesn't mean they're not your parents anymore. HaKadosh Baruch Hu and us have a relationship that is not dependent on anything. But that's also a problem. The problem is that just because we have a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu that is unconditional, does not mean that we're the best children of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. 
ultimately there'll come a time where HaKadosh Baruch Hu is hoping, where our parents hope, to pass the baton off to the world. That we'll be the ones who'll be able to continue the work, to be able to do the mission. And we might be children that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves, but if we're not cut out for the job, if we haven't done the inner work, then we're not yet ready for Kriyat Shema of the, evening, of the morning. Kriyat Shema of the evening. The internal Kriyat Shema, that evening Kriyat Shema, Kapara doesn't hold us back. Because that connection between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is unconditional. Where does our sacrifice, where does our Kapara begin to hold us back? Where does it begin to not work out for us? When do we need it the most? Is when we are ready to step up to the plate and to go out into the world and give the world the message that the world needs to hear. Until that happens, until we are the right people to make that happen, then it just it, it won't work out for us. It won't be well for us. I think a lot about this. We talk about universal messages the Jewish community has to offer to the world. Teachings, timeless teachings, important things the whole world needs to hear. And I look at the Jewish people and I say, are you serious? Does this look like a Jewish community who will be able to teach anything to the world? Is there anything we can come to the world and say, look at us, we're perfect, we're great, we're amazing, without them poking holes right through the facade? Are we ready? Do we have mature, sophisticated answers to the questions that the world has that until today they have not received satisfactory answers for? If we know everything, and we're the best of everything, we know at top of everything, so why are so many of the Jewish children running away for the hills? Why are they abandoning the Jewish community right and left? Why? Because we haven't done that work yet. The connection of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and by the way, I think it's important to know, when we speak harshly about the Jewish community, never in a moment do we think that by speaking harshly about the Jewish people, we're somehow severing the connection between them and, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. By the way, I have a hard time with something. I'll tell you the truth. Right now I'm going to say something off the cuff. Maybe I shouldn't say Okay, if I regret saying it, then I'll regret saying it later. I think everybody here knows how much, not just myself, but my kahila, has gone out of their way to do everything we possibly can to welcome Gerim into the Jewish people in a way that I don't think any other community on earth does. I'm, I'm being honest with you. From our Bet Adin to the way our kahila operates with these things, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to see. And someone recently asked me, so what makes or breaks a person? Do you know how many people start this process that never finish? And in my bit, Adin, it's not because we've discouraged people or we throw people out. That's never the reason. We're not from those guys. There's two types of people that come to join Amish Land. Those who join because there's some truth that they've discovered. They went through the religions. They started in another faith. They went through Christianity to Messianic Judaism, back to Torah. And then they come to Am Yisrael. And their whole world is built on telling the Jewish people how wrong they are and how much better they understand the Torah than they do. And then there's a person who comes and says, I've done this whole journey. I have what to contribute. But I want to be part of this people. I want to be a brother and a sister of these people. I want to be in, involved. I want to be not assimilated in the sense of being lost. But I want to be mitmazeg. I want to be, uh, there's a word for this uh, in English. I want to fuse myself into the Jewish people. I come with humility. I come with understanding that the Jewish people, there are issues in the Jewish community, but we've been struggling with these issues for thousands of years. Our Chachamim who wrote the Talmud were not fools. And just because you think that it's the first time you read a Pasuk, doesn't mean you have the right to throw Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai out of the window, or Hillel, or Shammai, or whoever else writes. Rabbi Yudah Nasi. You know, in general, the attitude of Rabbi Yudah Halavi, if you recall, Rabbi Yudah Halavi, remember when he speaks, there's two books, two famous books of Jewish philosophy. That of the Rambam, the Moren of Uchim, which he's writing to the perplexed Jewish person who's struggling, struggling with the Jewish faith. 
And the Rambam goes, almost bends over backwards to explain everything he possibly can in words that are understood and in concepts that are understood. And then you have Rabbi Yudah Anavi. Rabbi Yudah Anavi in his Kuzari is almost militant. Forgive me to borrow that term. Like, you don't like it, leave it. But this is the way that we do it. This is the way we believe. This is the way our Chachamim taught us. And sometimes you wonder, like, a little more tolerance of the Rambam would have been wonderful to find in the Kuzari. That's exactly the point. The point is that Rambam is talking to the children of the creator of the universe. It doesn't make a difference what you do or you don't do, you're in. I just need to help you become better. Rabbi Yudha Levi is talking to the king of Kuzar. And that to his king of Kuzar, nobody's making you do what you want to do. This is a journey you want to take. So accept, accept what Am Yisrael knows to be true. You don't want to do it, nobody's going to make you do it. You don't have to be here. But when you come here, come with humility. Come with the acceptance of the Mishnah and the Talmud that's binding on yourself. Don't come here with arrogance, with gava. And the wonders that a person like the king of Kuzal can do once he's in the Jewish community is transformative. Those neshamot that came to us, that have, in every single way, I always tell people, the only people, mechilat to all the rest of the people in my community, the role models of my children in my kina, of course everybody's a role model. But when my child is going to ask the question, why do I want to stay in the Jewish community? Why don't I go and leave the Jewish community? Well, everybody who grew up in the Jewish community doesn't have an answer to that question because they never faced that struggle. But all of those who left the world and came to the Jewish people, they have the answer to that question. They're going to educate my children. They'll be the role models of my children. There's a connection to the Kadosh Baruch Hu that the Jewish people have. It doesn't hold us back from coming to the creator of the universe. We can always come to our parents. Just because we can come to our parents whenever we want, and they will love us whenever we want, doesn't mean that we're the perfect children that our parents wanted. In order to reach the next stage, where we can properly represent who we are to the rest of the world, that takes a lot of work. That takes deep work. Not just on the individual level, not just on the communal level, but on the national level. And so long as there are major issues plaguing the Jewish people, if we haven't done the work of kapara, of atonement, of purification, it's not enough that the sun set. It's not enough that three stars have come out. It's not enough that right now is the time of the Mashiach. For sure the world is ready. Look at the world. The world is ready for the message we have to bring the world. The non-Jews are disenchanted with all kinds of things and are looking for emet. But I think of any generation, I could say I'm lucky to live in a world where the non-Jews that I interact with on a day-to-day basis are good people. Even righteous people. People who want to know what is emet. They want to know what is true. It's not a surprise that today, all around the world, people are running to join the Jewish people. The time is ready. The time is right. The question, are the Jewish people ready? Are we ready to step up to the plate and give an answer, a ma'aneh to the world? And sadly, I don't think that answer is yes. At least not yet. Rav Kuk is teaching us something profound. We are so used to just being children of Hashem. And because of that, what we do doesn't matter. Not chaz shalom that I'm saying rewarded consequences don't matter. But that's between us and the Creator. We're always going to be Jews. We're children of Hashem. Hashem loves us. Hashem is going to take care of us. That's fine. But that's survival mode. At which point do we realize that it won't ruin our relationship between us and the Creator, but it will ruin the rest of the world if we don't do what it takes to be good people, to be just people, to be righteous people, to be children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to be children that really represent the values of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to bring to the world. And I think that we have to stop being so comfortable and having this fallback. HaKadosh Baruch Hu always will love me. Yeah, it's true. HaKadosh Baruch Hu always love you. I once saw a license plate. Forgive me for this. Uh, I was here in uh, Genesee. Somebody was driving in front of me and the license plate said, Jesus loves you. And the bottom it said, and everyone else thinks that you're an idiot. And that is profound. Just because HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves you doesn't mean that everybody else thinks he, they love you too. You might be an idiot for the rest of the world. And Am Yisrael, we mentioned the Kuzari, let's end with the Kuzari. 
The king has his dream. He wants to know the truth. He goes to the Greeks and he goes to the Christians and he goes to the Muslims. He doesn't even think of going to the Jewish person. Why not go to the Jewish person? What holds the king back from going to the Jewish person? The English subtitle for the book of the Khuzari, you know what it's called? At least the edition I have. I don't remember the English subtitle, but I, it's, he doesn't go to the Jews because they're, they're, nobody likes them and they're wrong. That's right. He does, I think. Something like that. The, on my, on my book, the English subtitle says, In Defense of the Despised Faith. The Jewish people don't have answers. Everybody knows that. The Jewish people are so downtrodden and so despised and so. How can they possibly have the answers for anything? So here you have a world that is ready for answers. You have nations of the world which are on a search for truth like never before. HaKadosh Bahu is opening up these gates as a window of opportunity and time. And here we are still playing this game of unconditional love. HaKadosh Bahu loves us anyways. Why do we have to work hard? Why do we have to refine ourselves? Why do we have to fix ourselves? Eh, Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. Gula, Gula, tip the scales, all kinds of cliche slogans people throw around. What do you mean Mashiach, Mashiach, tipping scales? We have to take our future seriously. Not just our future, the whole world is looking at us. And say, when will we begin to create Jewish people, Jewish leaders, Jewish thought leaders, Jewish chachamim, communities of people, in which nations of the world could come and say, wow, that's what it looks like when people have the name of Hashem on them. That's what it looks like when the creator of the universe is resting somewhere, when the Shekhinah is found somewhere. We have ways to go, but we should never be disenchanted. Because as Rav Kook wrote earlier, that that inner work, nothing in the world is going to hold us back from doing it. The time, that's up to HaKadosh Baruch When the time is right, that's up to the creator of the universe. But the work that all of us know, what's cut out for us to do, that work we can start not tomorrow, we can start it already now. And B'zat Hashem, I believe, like the Rambam taught us, with complete faith. No matter how long it takes for the Gibbulah to come, I will wait for him every day. Wait for him? It doesn't mean waiting for him in my pajamas and bed. And if the bus comes, I'll get dressed, I'll drink my coffee, I'll run downstairs. Waiting means I'm waiting by the bus stop. I'm, wait, I'm ready. I've done everything I possibly can do. All that's left is for Bukhay Olam to send the bus. Great. That's what it means to be ready. Am Yisrael, it's time to be ready. It's time to be ready to prepare ourselves to prepare ourselves to say Shema Yisrael of the morning. For thousands of years, two thousand years, we're saying Shema Yisrael of Galut, Shema Yisrael of exile, Shema Yisrael of nighttime. But it's this close to saying Shema Yisrael of the morning. And the only way we can prob- possibly call out HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name in the morning to the whole world is Kaparato Me'akavto. Our sacrifice, our closeness to the Creator is what all of that is dependent on. We must do the work that it takes to get close to the Creator so that we can help the rest of the world down the same path we took to become close to the Creator of the world. We should live to see that day very, very soon.